we had everything going, we thought, perfect. And so we built all these churches, we built all these schools, and it all turned out to be short-lived. And now you're sort of back to almost where we were pre-war. So I think we have to put a lot of it into that perspective. On the shores of Lake Erie lie the many ornate churches of Erie, Pennsylvania. Some of these churches hold congregations that have been active for over 200 years. Many of the buildings are beautifully detailed, and the congregations they house work to serve the needs of the communities they inhabit. The churches of Erie are facing a problem, though. There are fewer people attending them. Back in the day, um, you know, it was a membership of 1,600 to 2,000. They had two or three, two services a day to accommodate that. And you would have on a Sunday morning probably 500 people. On Christmas Eve, we would have to put chairs in the back. It was standing room only. Church attendance today looks different. Um, our attendance, 125. 130 on an, on an average week now. When I've sat up here and looked at the, out at the congregation and counted, well, how many people are there? Generally, I come up with about the number of 30. I think um, when we look at American religious community life, most people look at the post-World War II era and see that as normal. That's actually an anomaly. If you take pre-World pre War II demographics, you then have a huge bubble over the baby boom. Our churches were full, our Catholic schools were full, our seminaries were packed, and um, we had everything going, we thought, perfect. And so we built all these churches, we built all these schools, and it all turned out to be short-lived. And now you're sort of back to almost where we were pre-war. So I think we have to put a lot of it into that perspective. While it doesn't surprise our religious leaders, it still causes concern. So it's, 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 it's of concern for a number of reasons. First, we want more people to be exposed to this, this way of love that we, we espouse but also because the work that we're doing in our communities and the impact that we're able to have is dependent upon the numbers of people who are in the orbit of the congregation. And that's what's changing. We, we've known it was gonna happen. Um, we are in a post-Christian post era. And I'm okay with that because if you look at why everyone was going to church in 1960, it's because of uh, McCarthy and, you know, if you're not going to church, you're a commie and we're going to just hose you with every possible way we can. And so people prove their Americanism by going to church. Not to say that there wasn't real faith, but I think we've balanced out to where real faith is now showing itself the way it should have. While this is true for many, there are some churches experiencing a different story. It's a growing congregation. I'm pretty excited about that. Yes, sir. There has been growth in black churches, Asian churches, and within those of the many new Americans. The Muslim community, they are increasing here. And I don't know how much they will increase more and more, but we expected more increasing. But some people have suggested this growth stems from a need for sanctuary from the world they exist in. Meanwhile, religious leadership is also in decline. When I was confirmed many years ago, I'm sure there were about 30 of us in that class. Now our confirmation groups might be one or two or three. When I was in the uh, doing my theology studies in Baltimore in the late 1960s, there were 550 of us in that seminary. Today, there are 70. 
But once again, this is considered as a rebalancing. We see, uh, if you look in the historical records, uh, people aren't going into religious vocations. You could have written that in 1890. We had uh, Catholic leaders who rang their hands about the same thing. So it is really the case that post-World War II, 1950s and 60s, uh, is a real anomaly. And I think we are returning to a more historical baseline. This decline in attendance appears to stem from a disconnect with the needs of a modern society. When, when these parishes were started, um, the congregation were usually illiterate. The priest was the only literate person in the congregation. There might have been a doctor or an attorney or something, but beyond that, they weren't. Today, our young people particularly are highly educated and they're sophisticated. And if something doesn't hold their attention, they're not gonna pay any attention to it. The liturgy itself, it, is it speaking to them? If it's not speaking to them, then how do we make it speak to them? It is a new generation. It is a new challenges. It is a new education. We have to think in different way. Everybody's busy today. Whether you're in high school or whether you're retired, everybody's busy. And everybody has lots of organizations or others that are clamoring for their attention or their resources. I think people's attention spans today are very, very short. And you can hold people's attention if you've got something of quality to say, but you're not gonna hold them for 20 minutes. But some disagree. I think that football games and basketball games and soccer games on television are, uh, are, are pretty lengthy. I have ADHD, so I know how to compete with short attention spans because I have one. And at the same time, competition's the wrong word. If you're trying to add more to their life, their life's already busy enough. How do you add value without um, adding stuff? How do you add quality without adding quantity? Those are very challenging issues to deal with. And I don't know how we, you know, maintain or respond to some of that, but we have to keep trying. We just can't say, oh, well, you know, we failed, so we'll just let them go. We have to keep trying. And will we be perfect in getting everyone in? No, we haven't done that 2,000 years. You couldn't take a selfie with a rotary phone 40 years ago. Uh, things have changed a bit. If we're still doing things the same as we did 40 years ago, we are failing our society around us. We're failing our community. I think there is a um, really a shift in the 80s where parents suddenly didn't want to shove down their kid's throat the faith that they had shoved down their throat. And so they said, oh, I'll let them decide. And that's really where it started. And now you have these same kids who are now parents not having something that they think is really a, 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 an important faith base. It's, it's not important to me. And Judaism is, I think, flexible in that sense of it being a, a, an experience that says, you know, um, you can come on Friday night if you want. You can come on Saturday morning. You can come just to learn. You can come just to participate. You can come just for the holidays, it's fine. Uh, and so I think that in lots of ways, it's this openness to meeting people where they are, at least in, in our congregation, and allowing them to explore and experience Judaism in whatever way that makes sense and is comfortable for them and their families. And we just have to accept the fact that um, if we're not going to meet the younger people today where they're at, then this is irrelevant to them. And, um, and that's our responsibility to do. It's not their responsibility to come begging us. It, it's our responsibility. And uh, I think we're failing them miserably in that. Aside from providing a place of worship, religious communities also meet other responsibilities. This includes providing a sanctuary. 
we have a, human, a humanitarian goal, take care of the others. The church the responsibility is to be there, to be the sentinel of protection, to be the refuge for the forgotten within our community. It is the church. I believe that with every fiber of my being. During the civil rights movement, churches were packed, especially down south. I mean, the rates of, of anti-Semitic incidences have skyrocketed um, for, for really inexplicable reasons, right? We don't really understand why. It's not like you had some major Jewish involvement with anything. Thus, thus one of the basic goals of the centers or the church or any religion institution, people, they come here, they want to feel comfort because everyone has problems. So whether it's hatred against African Americans or people of, uh, you know, any other, you know, identifiable group, um, you know, the uh, the intolerances of what you don't know are are primarily those that are just afraid of what they don't know, and uh, they end up doing these horrible acts, whether it's violence or uh, threatening or persecution or horrible comments or whatever it might be. I think that in many ways, you know, this is a place where the members of the Jewish community don't have to look over their shoulder, right? You don't have to worry about what your, you know, what, what somebody at the store or a coworker or somebody might be thinking or saying, right? Um, that you can simply be free to express your Judaism as you want and as you see fit without having to worry. I think our teenagers especially uh, deal with some of this. And, and so, you know, they've had to face lots of anti-Semitism when you're the only Jewish kid in your class, or maybe you're the only Jewish kid in your school. Often that means that you're also the target. But with fewer people attending, there's less money coming into the churches, putting strain on the ability to provide care in the community and maintain a place of sanctuary. As far as helping people, there are people, well, it's not about the money. It is about the money. You got to keep the lights on. You have to keep the water on. You have to be able to provide services. You got to bring the elderly, the elderly, the lifeblood of the church. You got to bring them um, um, to church. It is about the money. This strain is a big departure from the 1950s America. All the meaningful things in life sort of happened in the church. It was the hub of social interaction. It was the hub of service in the community. If you needed help, you went to the church. And these church communities rose to meet the needs that they observed around them. From the very beginning, the people who founded this church were concerned about the community around it. In many ways, the church helped to fill in the gaps in the community. And one of them at a particular time in the, in the 1870s and 80s was healthcare in, in the community. And this congregation founded Hammett Hospital. The relationship between religion and healthcare goes back centuries. The same is true for education. One name that was instrumental in bringing much of this needed infrastructure to Erie, Pennsylvania was Bishop Gannon. I mean, John Mark Gannon was an incredible builder. He built hospitals, he built convents, he built schools, he built universities and colleges. And um, this is perhaps one thing that maybe my generation and, and younger ones misunderstand, that there are great things that can be done with capital. There are great things that can be done when people sacrifice their own wealth to a larger cause, a greater cause. And John Mark Gannon understood that. He was able to inspire people, to contribute to a vision, a vision that came to be embodied in hospitals, schools, churches, and so forth. These were administered to by those known as the religious, followers of Christianity who have committed themselves to God, more commonly referred to as monks or nuns.
Well, very early on, the religious were very important to the startup of the diocese. So we had the Sisters of St. Joseph, the Benedictine Sisters, the Sisters of Mercy. And many of these communities ran hospitals. In fact, St. Vincent Hospital, the first hospital in the city, began under the leadership of the Sisters of St. Joseph. I was curious as to whether Erie's religious of today thought Erie's Catholic community would have been able to function without them. Definitely not. No question in my mind. Definitely not. The sisters have played a valuable role in Erie in a variety of ways. Not even a question. Mm -hmm. The religious women were central in the provision of health care and in the 1950s, one in five hospital beds in America was made possible through the work of nuns. They were the first large network of female professionals in a time when employment opportunities for women were few and far between. They made up 20% of nurses during the Civil War and their fearless work in the face of disease and battle marked the initial shift away from the widely held anti-Catholic sentiment of the time. And in Erie, Pennsylvania, they were essential providers of education. Most of the sisters at that time staffed all of our Catholic schools. They also had Villa Maria College, which the Sisters of St. Joseph started. Mercyhurst University was started by the Sisters of Mercy. So the religious women in this diocese were very important for the educational piece and they continued to be a crucial part of that framework for many decades. We were mostly teachers in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I taught for 17 years, but then after Vatican II, new things emerged, mainly because of listening to the needs of the people. Yeah. Yes. Vatican II was a meeting at the Vatican Council in the 1960s called by Pope John XXIII a significant rethinking of how the Catholic Church would engage with a society that was going through some drastic cultural shifts resulted in a new approach to religious leadership. Churches have always been social service agencies. And as much as the secular world likes to talk about taking care of one's brother, one's sister, we're not really doing a particularly good job of that. Churches always function out of a position of, 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 of self-gift, of giving, of, of strengthening the community. And I think that's even true today. The church is still all of those things. I think that government agencies alone aren't going to be able to solve all of the issues. I mean, government is so tied into politics, which can be very partisan and can shift. So I think that is, you know, definitely a, a reason and a need for, for uh, religious organizations, religious communities to be able to fill in some of those gaps. And I think that, you know, the whole sense of the, the, the spirit, the soul of the person can't be ignored and that's something that religious communities and organizations can really address. We don't have the expertise that a lot of the agencies in town have. We don't know all the resources that are available. So we really do our best to connect folks who come in who are in need, folks come who look for food or clothing, which generally we can help with. But there's folks who need have a lot greater needs than we can deal with. And so we connect uh, people with those agencies in town that can really best serve their needs. No agency, no church, nobody can do everything. But they remain driven to make themselves available to those in need. However we said it, we all have different ways of saying it, but we're all saying the same thing. We care about the poor, the, those who are downtrodden, who need us the most. And if we educate people, through, the, through what we have done over the years, we have helped them to see the importance of carrying that forward. But it goes beyond this simple provision of services. Um, it's great to feed people who are hungry, but why are they hungry? Why does this person not have a place to sleep or to live? 
and I know the leaders of our, our ministries who work in these areas are part of groups that really want to address those bigger questions, right? You can keep slapping a Band-Aid on this every week, forever. Okay, so the person who was hungry is now fed. But systemically, what's going on that this person is coming back again and again and again? We as the church, you know, we feel like we're stepping in and doing a part to help this, and that's great. But what's the bigger question that needs to be asked and addressed in the midst of all this? The goal is to not, is to not have to open the doors in the wintertime, to not have to have the shelter. That's the, those are the bigger questions that I really struggle with as we interact with other churches that are doing these ministries, as we have our own folks in leadership in these ministries who know those people and are interacting with folks in county government and in city government. Why can't we seem to get a handle on this? Trying to help resolve these issues is much harder to do in the face of a shrinking congregation. They're struggling to survive. They're struggling to stay open. And you're seeing some churches close or combine and they'll combine leadership because you also see fewer and fewer people going into the ministry. So we're seeing some real significant losses for some of those communities and churches just closing. Nobody wants to close their doors. These churches that merge together with one priest or one, they try to keep both buildings open because the, the connection to the building means so much to people. The building is nice, but if we didn't have the building, we'd find another way to worship God. They're, they found a way, if that's what they were looking for. You know, when you have a 110-year-old building, you're bound to have maintenance problems constantly. It takes a lot to maintain this church, and it takes a lot of people power. And of course, it requires financial resources. And that has changed over, over the years. How much time and money go into maintaining this structure? Too much. And that, that's, a, that's a base reality. People somehow think we're loaded. It seems like in the last several years, we, don't, we can't balance the budget with just contributions that come in from the congregations. That requires us to tap into these endowments. And they're nice endowments, but they aren't going to last forever. You know, we've got this huge structure that we continue to support and keep as nice as we can. But how long does that going to happen? Um, to, when, when do you reach the point where you say, this really isn't a good use of our resources anymore? And so it's going to be, there's going to be a day of reckoning, and I, I hope I'm not here to be part of it, which is sad. We spoke with Bishop Persico about the consolidation of parishes and the closing of buildings that he implemented as a cost-cutting measure in 2016. It just didn't work anymore. So a few years ago, after I talked to the uh, parishioners, uh, they were, uh, the parish was closed. Just seven years later, and one week before this episode's original air date in 2023, and he has been forced to close yet more buildings. We're we're rich in, in land and buildings, but poor in people. It's very hard because we, sometimes you have families in these churches for generations. I am a member of St. John's Lutheran Church by virtue of the fact that my parents brought me here. Uh, they were married here. My mother grew up in this neighborhood and she uh, was part of this congregation in her childhood and then all the way through her life. And these are where my friends are and they're the ones who helped my mother up the steps when she was singing in the choir. And they were the ones who greeted my parents when they were too old to walk down to the pews and they sat in the back my parents would greet them on a Sunday, and it was a great idea for them to be out of the house and seeing people here. So, um, you know, I can look at those blue chairs and still think of mom and dad sitting back there, and my friends do too. 
Um, this is where our parents and our families were, and um, I have a sense of history when I come in this building also. It's, it's old and traditional, but um, I've lived 70 years of my life in this building too, so it's as much my home as the one that my father built out on the end of Cherry Street. Anytime we have to close a church, anytime we've reached the point where we can't sustain the building or we're, we're no longer able to carry on in the way that we're, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's challenging. It's because as much as we say the church is, is not the building, it's the people, the building features prominently in that. The, the memories, the way it looks, the way it smells the sounds in a, in a building, all of these are important to our faith formation and various aspects of our life. We may have buried a loved one, baptized a child for joyous and sad occasions. I asked Carolyn what it would mean to her if the doors of St. John's ever had to close for the last time. That makes me uh, emotional because there have been so many generations here and it has been a place that's been meaningful to my family. We are, we are maintaining uh, a legacy here, but we also look at the practicalities of things. We know this is a large building, and being the caretakers of a large building is difficult. And trying to, um, even supporting a staff, supporting the pastors and whatever, many churches lose those opportunities. Just, um, just a couple, oh, I'm gonna stop. Chronicles was made possible thanks to a community assets grant provided by the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, Spring Hill Senior Living, support by the Department of Education, and the generous support of Thomas B. Hagen. This is WQLN.